welcome to the Polygamer Podcast, where gaming is for everyone. Join us as we expand the boundaries of the gaming community. Hello and welcome to the Polygamer Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Gagney. You know my voice from speaking about video games. Today, you'll be hearing from someone whose voice you know from speaking in video games. She's performed in such hits as Gone Home, Uncharted 4, Pyre, Anthem, Final Fantasy XV, and most recently, After Party, released just last month for the Nintendo Switch. She is a labor advocate and co-organizer of the global game developer conference Game Dev World, as well as a voiceover consultant. I'm pleased to welcome to Polygamer episode number 100... Sarah O'Malley. Hello, Sarah. Hi, congratulations on... This is 100 exactly? Exactly. I've been oh doing this God. show for about like six or seven years, and you're here to celebrate. Thank you. That's a huge milestone. I feel like this should be about <laughs> you now. <laughs> I don't know. Like, oh, no, no, no. The whole point of the podcast is for it to not be about me. So, mm. <laughs> yes. So, first and foremost, let me ask you the most important question. How are you? Are you okay? Oh, oh my gosh. Um, I'm okay. I could be worse. I could be so much worse. I mean, as soon as I say that out loud, I could be so much worse. Like, I like immediately begin to take on the gravity of the macro situation, right? Which is pretty intense. The micro situation is more comical sitcom shenanigans. Like, I need to clean my house. And, oh, gosh, I didn't get that chore done. And, oh, geez. Like, it's a little less, um, a little less serious than, than how things could be. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm fine. <laughs> is the answer. Well, good. This pandemic is hitting everybody in so many different ways, in ways that we didn't anticipate, and we're trying to make the most of it, which for some people is just getting through the day. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your career and how you landed in this profession. From my understanding, you started off as a dancer, got <laughs> injured, went into <laughs> musical theater, <laughs> and now you're a voice actor. So, yeah. so I have to wonder, are you exactly where you were aiming to be? Or is this just a comedy of errors? Well, I want to I should be really, really clear when it's like, it sounds like I did, you know, I was in, in a, you know, American Ballet Theater, and then I did Broadway. And then I did, that's, <laughs> I, we're talking about high school people. Like, that's when I, I danced from when I was like, three to 14. And then I, that injury led me to discover high school musical theater, which I loved and could to do a whole podcast about because save all the arts programs across the country, please. It was so powerful. Um mm -hmm. And then in college, I did radio dramas, which kind of combined with having played and loved LucasArts adventure games and Bioware games and games in general from when I was young. So I was aware of games and the people who voiced games a little bit in that half of my life. And then doing radio dramas in college was really the wake up call to like exploring my own range and having fun with just using my voice and things like that. So, um, but the answer, you know, did I end up where I was intending was when I, I spent some time after college in New York um, exploring theater, loving theater, not really liking auditioning for theater, but loving doing theater and just kind of getting a sense for what these different acting categories means as a lifestyle, not just as a medium that's fun when it's really works like in theater, when you have a great cast and a great script and, and all of that in place and a good director. But what it's like when things go bad, how bad is it when things go bad in that category? How, how frustrating is it and painful is it or fun is it to audition all day every day when that's most of what your job is? So by the time I was like a couple of years in in New York City, I was really enjoying the practice of auditioning for voiceover. I found it less stressful and more fun, more playful, more casual than other categories and really sort of beginning to embrace what it would look like to be a voiceover actor in a really large sense, in the sense of having it as a career as well as just the fun of odd jobs um, or the, a given project. So, um, so most of my professional credits that anyone would kind of, you know, agree are respectable are, are in games. So in that from that view, from that lens, you would I would say, yeah, I I pretty much gunned straight for for video game voiceover from that realization. And that's what I've been doing. I can appreciate how exhausting auditioning can be. I did a lot of community theater. I tried auditioning mm. professionally in New York City and it's just mm. so debilitating. But you're saying it's yeah, different it's as a voice actor? Oh yeah. Oh Miles. I mean and look, I'm sure there are certainly with time, maybe maybe even I would feel differently if I'd spent all this time shedding my inhibitions and worries and all kinds of stuff that as a young actor torture you no matter what category you're in. But um, uh, when I was in New York auditioning for theater and auditioning for voiceover, oh my God, night and day. I mean, like, first of all, a theater audition or an on-camera audition, especially like your audition's almost 90% over by the time you walk in the room. I mean, granted, if you look exactly like your headshot, they should have you in on purpose and they, and they should be expecting what you look like. 
But just being judged out of the gate of whether you look right for something is not something at all that I worry about with voiceover. You know, I come in, most people are very friendly. I mean, I would say New York casting directors, even for commercials and in voiceover, are like a certain breed of intense. But um, but overall, the mood is so relaxed and easygoing and people... In, in game voiceover tend to just be more hopeful that you're going to be what they're looking for and that you're just going to have a nice time together. And the job of an actor is to go in and, and think of that audition moment as as their opportunity to do the job. Ooh, I get to do this job for, for half an hour. That's so fun. Like, look at this character. They're great. This is my this is my work day. I got to do this. Not like, I hope they give this thing to me is a, a sort of a less powerful, fun position to put yourself in as a mind state. Um, and I feel like that's more true in game voiceover. You go in, you read a little bit, you're in jeans, you're in, it doesn't matter what you look like or what you're wearing. You, you know, you read it a couple times through easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It's, it's really nice. <laughs> and so I was like, Oh, this is good. <laughs> I hated monologues. Uh, some, if I, one day I'll find theater monologues that I absolutely love. I feel like monologues outside of Shakespeare are really touch and go for me as a thing that kind of feel like potholes in a play. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so just the I, I did not find my way into enjoying theater auditions where some people may may have before I decided to commit to this. Is that to say that voice auditions don't have like the cattle calls you see in New York where they just bring in hundreds of people and you're all sitting mm. in the same waiting room? Oh God. I mean, I've seen no, it's never more than like five or six people in the same casting slot for a voiceover that I've experienced. So you might see a few people in the waiting room. And I feel like in the early days I'd be like, Oh, that's what I'm up against. Oh blah. But now like with you know, I know so many other game voice actors and I'm such a fan of them. Like game voice actors by and large are very down to earth people, very friendly. And we all kind of like refer each other for jobs and are excited for each other. And there isn't the same quite kind of competitive aspect. You realize you're kind of competing with yourself a little bit, you know, which is always true. But it's nice to see people in the waiting room for game stuff. Usually, I mean, it might, you might be a little nervous or you might be like, they'd be really good for that. That's a good idea. <laughs> but there, it's also just pleasant to catch up with folks. So it's, it's not so fraught. It's really not so fraught. <laughs> it sounds in some ways less competitive. I think as a community, we're less competitive. I think that. I think so. I, 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 I you know, you only meet voice of other voice actors when you do games mainly through really conscious, purposeful networking and, and introducing each other to each other because you don't work um, to, together, right? You're mainly recording if it's booth voiceover on your own. And, and many auditions are MP3 auditions. So, th so it's very rare actually to have that casting call kind of experience auditioning in person, um, uh, certainly with other people in the waiting room around you. So yeah, I think we are less competitive. I think so. We all have like a good, a bit of, a good bit of range and different signatures and, and, and just sort of people. Yeah. I don't know. I think, feel like we, it's not quite so, that's just not the vibe which I love. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so how do you get the opportunities? Do you apply to audition? Do they come to you and say, we have a part for you? Do you have an agent? I do have an agent. I, this is not something you hear often, but like, I love my agents. I think they're great. <laughs> <laughs> I love having someone who's an advocate for me. Um, if, you know, if there's something isn't quite handled properly, I have someone who get who can be the bad guy or, or just sort of be firm about something, whereas I just get to stay the cozy, sweet, you know, talent side of things. I think that separation, even if you are someone who is capable of negotiating for yourself and, and understanding all of the, the details of contracts and things like having that multi-role division um, specialization is really useful to me. And they're just hardworking and sweet people. I've, I felt I've had different agents before and this particular relationship has always felt very like an open communication. I talk about what I'm interested in, what I'm most passionate about, what I'm not really passionate about necessarily. You know, I talk about, they, I feel like they are interested in and have a sense of my range and what I can do. They're paying attention to kind of what sticks with me and what I respond to. And I just feel very free to discuss openly where I'm at and what I want with them, which isn't always true. I mean, when you're, especially when you first get an agent, you just, you want to please them so bad and you want to, and I still want to please my agents because they're awesome. But like, <laughs> you know, you're just, you're in this weird, you like you work for each other, you make money together. So it should be like a partnership, you know? And so, so often, you know, in New York, I, I didn't have that feeling where I was like, oh, I'm wasting their time or like, I hope they still believe in me or, uh, uh, you know, pressure to book and blah, blah, blah. So it's a, it's a very, I wish I had advice on how to find that fit. It's a really, really, really tricky thing to find and do, but, um, but I'm lucky. And I, this was my dream. Like, this was my first choice agency when I moved out here. I, it was the first meeting I took um, when I was exploring living, moving to Los Angeles. 
And when they said they would sign me, I was like, great. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Do you want to plug that agency? Sure. SBV Talent. They had, and, and, and the main reason was they had a lot of my favorite voice actors from games. You know, they had Bioware folks and Naughty Dog folks. And um, it seems like their agent who was handling games was really passionate about games as a category because she wound up representing many of these wonderful performances. Um, so many folks who've been there have been there for like a couple decades you know, I mean, they really stick around. There's a sense of family, um, which I really love. So what is it you've told your agent you're passionate about? What is it that you want to do? <laughs> games. <laughs> <laughs> I told them I love games. I came, I mean, it, what, you know, here's some more shop talk, but like, it's a, it's good. You do want to present a value proposition to your agency and that can mean versatility. It means, you know, maybe being, being gifted or amenable or willing to learn up and, and kind of be competitive in uh, multiple categories. So at the time when I came to them, I had booked a number of indie games on my own out of New York, but I was really, my stronger case was in commercials. I'd booked a few national commercials. I had a really nice sounding commercial demo. So kind of like coming to them with an, a, a bunch of different categories that I was open to and, and aware of was kind of key. So um, I still need to give better attention to animation because animation is so fun. I like, I don't, I play games more than I watch cartoons, which is why I've focused so hard on this stuff on games. But um, but I would love to do more, mainly because they record together more often than they do in, in games. So the one the one uh, animation thing I've done, which just actually aired for the first time on Netflix, it's a uh, glitch text. I'm in episode, I think, six. And I got to record, you know, in the same room with at the same time as Ashley Birch and Nolan North. And we just had like a hoot and you're, you're sort of goofing off and improvising. And it's like a party. It's so fun. So um. Uh, if uh, my agents listening to this are like, Sarah, you need to you need to take animation more seriously. And I'm like, yes, yes, I will. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> I will be good for you and it'll make it easier for you to pitch me and it'll be great. <laughs> you know. Well, that's wonderful. That sounds like an all star cast that you've uh, all people you've worked with before and you probably had a, a lot of fun together. Oh, that was so fun. I mean, I've I've been like a Nolan North fan for like Uncharted 2 was a huge reason that I thought not only that I would pursue games, but that I might focus on them, that they might be like creatively fulfilling enough to really focus on and commit to. So yeah, Nolan is, yeah, looms large. And Ashley is a wonderful human. I've known her for a while and we have a really similar sense of humor, which is why it's been so easy to direct her actually um, on a different game. But um, that was a great day. I was like, ooh, if every day of animation is like this, sign me up, <laughs> you know, please. <laughs> Yeah, we'll definitely be talking more about voice directing and also about Ashley. But I also want to ask you, mm. you've worked on games like Uncharted and Gears 5 and Anthem, AAA titles. Mm. And as you mentioned, in New York, you worked on indie titles, and those mm -hmm. can include Gone Home, ROM 2064, After Party. Do you have a preference or have you told your agent, I want to work on big AAA titles or I prefer the smaller indie stuff? That's interesting. I mean, I want to work on good things. <laughs> I don't think that's very, that makes me very unique. <laughs> um, uh, it's not a very fancy answer. I want to work on good stuff, but it's true. <laughs> like I, I love indies. I have worked really hard with the union and with um, just as a kind of a creative amb and cultural ambassador at, from actors to indies because indies have really beautiful experimental stories to tell, but have less access to the traditional voiceover casting and recording pipeline. It's everything's very entrenched in AAA and very kind of closed off, kind of mysterious. So I've done a lot of work personally and then now professionally consulting wise, kind of bridging those two worlds and arming indies with the same information they would need to kind of cast and, and work with really wonderful actors. So I, I did not want to leave indies behind when I moved to L.A. And I moved to L.A. to work with folks who had more resources and were telling kind of larger scale stories. Um, you know, Bioware and Naughty Dog were at the top of that list, um, which is a, a list that grows, which is wonderful. But yeah, so I've only ever wanted to, I've always wanted to do both. I've always wanted to do a breadth of things. And that's true of games, too. I, I play a breadth of things and I want to I want to see a breadth of, of styles of games and sizes of games made all the time. A lot of my advocacy work is in making the space more open to inspiration from different places and different kinds of games to be made. So I'm all about that variety. <laughs> yeah. So certainly the AAA games are telling more expansive stories. They have more resources. Have you found any difference from the voice actor perspective of it's a different experience working in one versus the other? Hmm. I think it's a good question. I feel like I because I'm trying to remember back to when I had mostly done indies and was new to AAA. I feel like there are certain classes, like types of voiceover days that, that are more common in AAA. 
you know, the, the idea of doing hundreds and hundreds of takes of or hundreds of lines, two takes each of like certain kinds of battle combat callouts is more of a triple A feature, maybe um, not necessarily. But in my experience, it was and indies were more likely to be kind of like idiosyncratic characters. And um, I was more likely to act outside of a signature that I've seemed to have developed in triple A, which is more of a tough chick kind of vibe variations on the tough chick. So indies tended to be more conversational, more more whimsical. I would say. And then in, in and then in AAA, it would be like, we have these this many lines to get through. It's a lot of lines and we're going to just sort of go at a clip. <laughs> we're going to do two in a row of this, 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 and this. And it's going to kind of feel samey when you're going to make it li- alive. And that's your job. So a little bit more deadline oriented, perhaps, in AAA? I mean, indies are also, I don't know, I don't know that I would say that because indies need to, you know, they, they have, they're counting their change a little more, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they're, I don't know if they think about it in the same way. Um. Hmm. I don't even know if they have the sort of wherewithal to break. Like, I think it's a new exercise for them to kind of look at their line counts and start to budget that way and like actually prepare ahead of time for that. Um, whereas AAA has it down to a science. I don't know. I guess both. <laughs> yeah. Hard to answer. Well, here's another comparison I'm curious about, mm. which is you've done a lot of musical theater. And mm. as you know, you have so many tools at your disposal. You have lighting, you have mm. costume, you have makeup. Mm-hmm. What is it like being a voice actor when you don't have those tools in your toolkit and all you have is your voice? Is it harder to perform? I don't think it's it's a specialization. I don't know that it's harder. It's harder in some ways and easier in others. I mean, I actually think theater maps better for that active imagining to voiceover than film does, maybe. Like, I miss the loss of a costume sometimes. You know, wearing heels does a certain thing to you or, you know, a certain skirt having a bit of play in it does a certain thing to you. So costume maybe I miss, I suppose. But I mean, if you're on a performance capture set, it's really not that different from like intimate theater in the round, except the audience isn't isn't there yet, (laughs) you know. But you're not acting to frame. You're just, it really comes down to your ability to invest your surroundings with realism and, and gravity and to, to, and, and make the relationships seem true and spontaneous with the people that you're with. So, I mean, that's a very close mapping in a way. Your projection is certainly very different. Um, I think performance capture, I think Amy Hennig distilled it down to like having a, an on camera face, a voiceover voice, which can be very intimate. And you can do a lot of in- intimate things that you would never get away with in theater. And then like a a sort of a theater in the round body. So you're kind of working that coordination, kind of being a little ambidextrous. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, me going from theater to radio drama, I was starting to be aware of what the limitations are, but what the freedom is too. Like it's limiting, but it's freeing. I find it vastly more freeing than limiting. Me personally, I'm still using my body. It's not getting, which is so fun. Like I'm still using my body to make all kinds of shapes just to to get sounds out of my voice. It's just not getting picked up and shown to the player, but it's still part of the creation process, which is fun. I love being cast for things that I would never get cast for in life. I would never get cast as the Raider in For Honor if someone saw a picture of me ever, (laughs) ever. It's so awesome. I love it. I love that. So I tend to relish kind of the subtlety and the the richness of what you can convey in your voice. And I find that really freeing and very, very um, full. So I don't feel that I don't feel that loss and that frustration. I think that um, although I will say that performance capture adding some of that in where you don't have to ex- make explicit with dialogue relationships and other things like that is really exciting. Um, the fact that you can just sort of close distance with each other and interact physically with each other and that kind of conveys information about who you are to each other. That's very thrilling. Um, so that adds some of that back in, which is good. When people appear on stage or in a movie, they expect to be recognized. It's part of you know their popularity, their fame that they capitalize on. Mm. Do you expect or hope to be recognized in games? <laughs> I, I have a bad habit of disbelieving that people do. <laughs> and not because it's like not because I, I not because I have some concept that I'm so good at disguising my voice that they never would. I just am shocked that my voice makes an impression on them that they could then summon when they hear it again. <laughs> I'm just like, how did you know it was me? They're like, I've listened to you before ever. What are you talking about? Um, friends and things usually. So that's where I come from. No, I don't expect to be recognized at all for that reason. I don't know. I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle. I have I have a range up, you know, I can, I can do higher voices. I'm cast more for lower voices. I have some okay accents in my back pocket and I study, you know, when I get hired for them, which is fun. So that, that does some to disguise my voice or can. A lot of it I think is actually sensibility. I was on a a podcast, an Anthem podcast last night 
And when we had this long, lovely podcast length conversation where I sounded like this and I was like goofy and silly and, you know, it, my voice lived here. And then at the very end, I just said some, you know, I said the slogan from there's like a little tagline from Anthem, you know, strong alone, stronger together. Um, and it went deeper into my range and that's sort of where more my freelancer lives. And their minds were blown. They were like, oh, my God, it's actually you. It's not just some <laughs> random person. So sometimes all it takes is a degree difference of of psychology and, um, you know, where your head's at. So it, it doesn't actually maybe even take much to kind of disguise your voice without having to go full cartoon. But no, I don't know. I think that our our industry is changing as far as voice actors, some voice actors developing a more visible profile um, through other means, you know, if they're streaming or if they're doing other stuff like that. So and that and that is, I think, seen as a benefit to to games who want uh, who who appreciate a, a recognizability factor when marketing to their fans and things like that. So we may see more of a premium placed on familiarity with voice actors um, and, and hoping to recognize them, looking for work that has them in it um, by their fans. That would be a new thing. That's like new to the last decade or so of voiceover. Before that, it was a fully anonymous kind of deal. So how do you choose what kind of voice or tone or register to use for a character such as in After Party, where you played mm -hmm. the sister of Satan himself? So good. <laughs> He's so good. I mean, we worked on that. They were very... Um, they were very, they're good directors and they had a really like specific aesthetic and sensibility that they wanted. I feel like probably what happened is I went in there with a stronger, slicker version of her, um, more like corporate lawyer, badass lady running a company kind of vibe. And then they stripped it back. They were like, she, they, they made her power a little more quiet, a little less self-announced. So if she was like, if I had gone in and been a little bit more like this, then they would have been like, okay, dial it back. What does it sound like if she's just yeah, I'm not really that worried about it. You guys will get back to me when you got the information. You know, like it just sort of takes a little less. I don't know if my examples just demonstrated what I'm hoping to say. But uh, but yeah, they, they sort of tuned those. Very often you're developing a voice on the fly. I mean, you send an audition in. You might not hear anything about what they liked from that audition until you get into the session. That's very. Uh, I've often gone into sessions not knowing what I'm doing or the game I'm in. Like, like I'll be like, what are we doing today? And they'll be like, you are a Russian soldier sniper person. Okay, cool. <laughs> sure. So sometimes you go in with an idea that you had and that, that, you know, you had a strong concept for the character right off the bat. Other times you go in and you have no idea what you're doing and you just build it together. So what was it like being the sister of Satan? I loved her. I loved that quiet <laughs> power of her. I felt like she was like, yeah, I felt like she was, oh man. She had high standards. She was actually a really good person, and she but she'd lived in this sort of cynical, debased world for a long time. So that combination of like exhaustion but core kind of goodness was really interesting to me. I have someone in my life who has gone through very close to me, very close to me, super precious to me, who has gone through a journey of addiction um, and worried about how to reach out to them, how to help them. You know, so all of that storyline was extremely personal to me. It felt very, very, it's it's always important for your character to be believable and to land with people. But it, I felt like I had to do justice to this piece um, for that reason, personal reason. Yeah, I loved, I mean, I loved their, I loved Oxenfree. I was so thrilled to work with them. So thrilled. Um, I knew that they would be funny, that it would be some of the funniest dialogue I'd have the pleasure to speak, that the world would be, you know, sassy and flavorful and and wild. So it was kind of a, it was a joy. She was, she was cool. I dug her. That's really impressive. I know so many actors prefer to tap into their own experiences and relate mm -hmm. to the character mm -hmm. and bring their own uh, life experiences. Yeah. But I can imagine it would be difficult to do that for such a fictional character in such a hellacious world. And yet oh, you no. still found a way to do it. Oh, nonsense. No, no. I mean, you, I think if you were the kind of person who is going to voice video games, like Nolan North, I think, said this a while back, like, it's like being a kid on the playground, when, especially performance capture. Like, you either as a person, as a human, are able to embrace your imagination and find truth and to believe in it so fully that you can make other people believe in it with you. That's just like a core fundamental necessity for this particular job. Again, because you don't have a set to kind of persuade you. Like, I, if I were wearing, like, you know a linen suit and I was in a, you know, in a, in a tropical island and it was, I was doing a spy movie. There would be many things, like you say, to help support your belief in the, in the world because it's the real world. 
But for games, you don't have that. All you have is the strength of your own imagination. So if you are, but if you are that kind of person, it doesn't matter how fantastical the world is. If the human, I mentioned this on a panel with David Gator, um, who who's the, who was the lead writer on the Dragon Age series for a long time. What what interests and speaks to an actor, what we have no problem investing in, is is the the truth of human physics. You know, you can set your world in a in a in dra- you know with dragons and elves and all kinds of magic, all kinds of stuff. But if people react to each other in a way that feels familiar from your world, from our world, then you have no problem believing in everything. That's like the truest thing to me. Is like it doesn't matter what people can do and what that what's around them. It's like if you recognize jealousy, if you recognize compassion, if there's if these relationships and the way that people bounce off each other are familiar and real, then it doesn't matter how silly the world is. I think it might be other people in other categories who find games silly in general that wouldn't buy in. But me, I'm like, great, let's go. Sure. Where are we? No problem. (laughs) You know, is that one of the things you love about video games as opposed to other media you might perform in? It's just the silliness. I don't even know if I would call it silly because I don't see it as silly. I just see it as fun and I see it as oh, um, right. creative. Which is how I meant it. Yeah, I, didn't, I, know, I, I certainly you. didn't mean to diminish it. You're right. I know you do. But, but whimsical. I mean, like I, yes, I think that if you throw aside what's supposed to be cool or what's supposed to be real and you say everything's game, it doesn't matter if it strikes us as foreign and odd, then you have new storytelling opportunities. You've just expanded what you can do. I mean, for example, in Dragon Age, like there's magic. And that world takes magic really seriously. So it's not just about the, the, you know, the, the flair of waving around a wand and just sort of having it be there for fun. That, that, that world building feature is, is a powerful storytelling tool. Who has magic? Who doesn't? What people who don't have magic do to people who do and vice versa? This is a new engine for human relationships and for storytelling that's really exciting and that you just wouldn't have if you didn't decide to pick up that tool and use it. So, um, so yes, I do. I feel very freed by what games can depict and what they can use to tell stories, and uh, and I do think that's very thrilling. And so it can be harder to sell fantastical worlds in other, you know, in other uh, contexts. Um, but games don't really seem to have a limit on that stuff. <laughs> so with all the whimsical, fun characters you've played in video games, if you could choose one to be in a live action movie to portray oh. in on screen, right? Who would that be? Wow, I get stuck. I have to just assume that I would be cast for it because again, I get, oh, yes. right. Because I would get stuck being like, I don't look like that person. I can think of a million actors <laughs> who look like that person who'd be great. Like I would cast, you know, Gwendolyn Christie as, as the Raider, obviously. Why wouldn't I? Then I'd be crazy <laughs> not to. But yeah, who would I want to play? I mean, again, I don't look quite right for her, but I do think Lexi Rivers has a cool look. She has a cool look. If that's what I'm going with, that's one way to go with it. She has a cool jacket. She's got cool hair. She just looks awesome. So running around doing sort of cop stuff, detective stuff as Lexi would be a cool look to have. I don't know. As far as like, I also think Lizzie would be fun. Lizzie would be so fun. Lizzie, the way that she sort of ended up as she evolved um, and got kind of wilder, a little, a little more silly perhaps, and which is, which is possible in a multiplayer mode. It doesn't have to kind of, it's a little more unhinged. Um, it's not pegged to, to the realism of a, of a single story. Lizzie, Lizzie's fun as heck. And it doesn't matter what I look like because she's got her helmet on. I would have to get ripped. That would be, <laughs> I would have to get ripped. But I think I could do it. I could probably do that. And for our listeners who may not have played these games, Lexi and Lizzie are from what? So Lexi Rivers is from 2064 uh, Read Only Memories. And she is kind of a, she's a, a protective a uh, cop, uh, de- a detective who encounters the player and, and has maybe a little bit of a romantic history with the player's uh, sister, which is fun. She's really, she's cool. And then Lizzie Carmine is the first Lady Carmine in a family of, an iconic family of red shirts who die off in every game that they appear in, um, in the Gears of War franchise. So Lizzie, that was a huge honor um, to live and then perhaps also not to live uh, as the first female carmine that was quite a joy (laughs) it's an honor just to have been nominated to live for sure oh yes that was i mean spoilers right like the law of gear says that she had to pass away but it was a very very big fun dramatic scene and that is delightful too (laughs) wonderful dying is great dying is fun (laughs) yeah oh yeah have you have you died often 
Uh, actually, a, a fan once called me. Um, I did a lot of adventure games in New York before I moved out here um, for a company called Wajedai Games. Um, they oh, do- yeah. Dave Gilbert. I know Dave. Yeah, Dave. Oh, I did gosh. a panel with him at PAX East a few years ago. No way, Dave. Yeah, so I, I did many, many games with Dave. And I died, I think, in every single one. So a fan once called me like the Sean Bean of Wajedai Games. And I was like, yes, oh, no. I know. I died a lot. <laughs> I died a lot. Dave, Steve Alexander, and Katie Hallahan from Phoenix Online Studios and I did a panel at PAX East about the mm. resurrection of point-and-click adventure games. Yeah, wonderful. Which was my way in, you know? I mean, I... I played games from a very, very early age, but like the part that I really, the moment that I really, really responded and was like fully gripped by game storytelling was like, was the adventure, the uh, LucasArts era adventure games. Adventure games have, in all their new forms too, they've evolved, um, they've been revived, they've been recreated, remastered. Um, adventure games in all their forms are my, are my, the deepest part of my little game's heart for sure. Do you have a favorite LucasArts game? It's tough. It's a tough one. I mean, I the the three years in a row where it was like full throttle, Curse of Monkey Island, Grim Fandango, like those were that was like ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. That was like life changing to me. Life changing to me. I mean, I played Curse of Monkey Island, and I'm pretty sure that it had a very strong effect on my sense of humor. Like a sort of weird, nerdy, like kind of pulling random references to things, very silly, kind of unashamedly silly sense of humor like i think that changed myself as a person <laughs> um i did love curse and then i went back and loved and played and loved the the earlier games too i think that was just the one that i hit as i hit the right age but it's also a really good one and it stayed so timeless that game it, it went from it was the big upgrade from pixel you know sort of pixel art to but before 3d um art and i mean no offense to escape from monkey island but like that it was way less expressive that kind of blocky 3d to the really painterly animated looking um 2d 2d illustrative kind of quality of curse so i think it really holds up some of the puzzles might be wacky that's a lucas arts thing it's no big deal but the performances are world class you know there's this myth that game voiceover has always been bad that is not true lucas arts crushed it so those performances hold up i think the jokes are funny as heck I think it looks good. It's a really good game. And Grim Fandango is amazing. Grim Fandango is obviously amazing. Ugh, please. I've never heard the myth that voiceovers are bad. Really? The game the game voiceover has been bad and is now just getting better? Never heard that one? I mean, I've heard full motion video games are the acting is terrible, but I thought voiceovers were pretty good. I think that just means you were paying attention. Like, if you didn't hear that, then you were playing those good games with good voiceover. I think there's, like, a joke that's just like, ah, game voiceover, it's so, ah, Jill, the master of unlocking, you know, like, whatever the, the joke may be. Um, okay, admittedly. Yeah, you know, whatever. It's But it's not true. The reality is it's not true. Because there was great, wonderful performances going way back. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been so inspired. Mark Hamill in Full Throttle, mwah, chef's kiss. Oh, my so gosh. Good. Yes, Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, when when the new Star Wars trilogy started, a friend of mine said, well, I'm glad Mark Hamill finally has acting again. It's not like he's done anything else in the last right, 30 like, years. Oh, I'm like, honey, you're not paying attention. You're not paying attention. Baby doll. An icon. <laughs> a legend. Of course. I know, right? I mean, Wing Commander, Batman. I have thought. It's so funny because like, I should just remember that I am fans of people that I'm now part of a professional peer community with because I keep talking about them like a fangirl. And I'm like, they'll never take me seriously. But But Mark <laughs> Hamill, like... I had thoughts. I remember doing a rewatch of Empire Strikes Back. I'm just going to go ahead and lay this on you. <laughs> My Let's like hear it. deep thoughts. I used to watch it. I used to watch Empire Strikes Back like every year for a very long time. It's one, it's one of my favorite movies. Um, and I remember the year that I watched Luke's scenes on. I used to give Mark sort of a bad rap, like he was always a better voice actor than he was an on-camera actor. That was my like my smug kind of self-satisfied opinion, which isn't accurate or meaningful. It doesn't matter who cares what I think. But in, a, in Empire, I love those scenes with Yoda so much. And as I get older, my the sort of core truth and value in Star Wars shifts ever more into the spiritual, I think, and into the Yoda scenes and into the sort of essential truth of what the Force is and how to be a good person. And I was always like, Yoda is this incredible creation. I mean, everything on Dagobah comes together, the lighting and the puppetry and the writing, and uh, nothing gets better than Yoda on Dagobah. But you watch Mark, and he sells it. Like, Yoda is there talking, and Frank Oz is a genius, but it takes Mark believing in that puppet to help us believe in that puppet. Mark is scared of the puppet. Mark is listening to the puppet, learning from the puppet. You know, I mean, he's like humbled by the puppet, frustrated. All of those feelings and all of that work 
to elevate Yoda as a person who we should respect as a mystical being is done by Mark. And I think that is such a voice actor's it's any actor, but it's a voice actor's ability because it's that same thing I was talking about before. It's like the power of his imagination to stare at a puppet and see all the people working behind the se- sleeves with, you know, with their behind the scenes with their hands up its butt and everything like and still give it truth. I think that's a voice actor's superpower. So I think he's always just been this person who's a wonderful actor who has a voice actor's kind of engine. And it's just made him an incredible performer. I, th- I thought he was amazing in the in the in the latest movies. I thought he was fantastic, and that his years doing voiceover must have contributed to that and helped deepen his his craft. I think, um, as it must have. So I don't know. That's my great Empire Strikes Back nugget of the day. <laughs> I love it. Have you heard Mark Hamill on the CD he did with Brent Spiner? No, no. <laughs> what? They 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 did a, a musical CD. Dreamland is a quote-unquote audio film that Brent Spiner did with Maude Maggart, where they are singing songs, but there's a narrative in between all the songs that weaves them together into a cohesive plot. It's so cute. Brent Spiner played every vocal part in Dreamland that was neither Brent Spiner nor Maude Maggart. So, basically, everybody else. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love him. He's so good. (laughs) He's so good at what he does. I have a Mark Hamill autograph. I have a Star Wars bathroom. This is so much TMI. Were we talking about my career? I'm a cool person. Oh, God. We'll come back to you. Um, we'll come back to me in the meantime. My bathroom. Hello. It has like a whole bunch of Star Wars autographs in it. Um, I don't know why they ended up in the bathroom. They just did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've got Mark on one side, Carrie on the other, Harrison. And I'm like so deeply inspired by them for such different reasons. Like Mark, obviously, for his voice acting. Carrie for her mind, like that she'd started as this like superhero princess and became this incredible mental health advocate and just a sophisticated, powerful writer in her own right. Just kind of the process of finding her voice in the spotlight from from being this what would have been an ingenue, you know, otherwise. And then Harrison just like being this wonderful tradesman of an actor. I feel like there's like that's like a prior generation of people who approach acting like they're a tool and then they work the tool to serve the project. And like he just, you know, he's explored his range somewhat to better and worse, you know, sort of reaction right but he he understands how to slot himself into a project and be of service to it and i always found that kind of like like down to earth no bs kind of approach to to being an actor really really inspiring and cool and it reminded me of like artists that i had met in my grandparents at my grandparents parties because they were all amazing actors from like the the world war ii and beyond um who had that same that same quality like not egotistical not very vain or maybe maybe vain but like an acute charming twinkly 40s way (laughs) um but like so practical and down to earth i love i love them yeah not very mystical about acting you get a lot of acting mysticism in la and i grew up i was blessed to grow up around people older actors than me who were very not fancy or sort of self-important about it about their process or about anything Mm. yeah you mentioned that the previous generation saw themselves as tools that they slot into a story do you Mm. feel that's different from how you approach acting no i don't think so i mean especially in games i mean games my god games will puncture your ego about how important you are as an actor very quickly (laughs) you know i mean you are on a on a movie set, I feel like what people get away with, you know, whatever's in their writers, you know, I want green Skittles in the green room, whatever, you know, like you can't really, I don't know, maybe some voice actors can request Skittles. I have no idea. Possible. But like, you know, you are like game, game there's so much more going on in a game than your piece. And in fact, the thing that makes me so sad is that we're so isolated from the rest of the production process. I don't feel like we get to have a team spirit because of we're not working alongside each other all the time ever really so yeah you are definitely i think folks who come from other categories might find it a little off-putting or or sort of a bummer to kind of realize just how much of a tool you are in service of something larger than yourself on a game compared to other things i mean you know the, the cameras stop and start for you when you are on a on a film um and certainly performance capture stops and start on you but performance capture is just one piece of a lot of stuff coming in a lot of people working hard on something so you have to be pretty comfortable with coming in and being a sort of a humble part of a larger whole if you're going to work in games and yet despite that isolation and the solitary nature of voice acting in a booth without anybody else around you nonetheless seem to be part of this community you seem very well connected you have friends colleagues so how does one build community as a voice actor that's a good question. I mean, do you mean with other voice actors or in general? What would you say is your primary community? Where do you find your connections? Well, it's interesting because before before I moved to LA, it was vastly more developers than it was other actors. You know, I mean, in, in New York, I moved to New York and my community was 
playwrights and writers and journalists and all kinds of other things. And I, to be honest, I miss that kind of variety of industry that I um, that I haven't quite cultivated here because I kind of came here for games. I do games. That's my circle now. But for for the ten year or the seven years that I was in New York, I was coming to the Game Developers Conference and networking. I was following folks on Twitter. I mean, the real answer is that I like my mom stage mommed me into talking to Richard Lamarchand um, at the hotel, not even on the PAX floor, at the hotel near PAX East. She was like, he's wearing a speaker badge. Go say hi. And I was like, that's so rude. I have no reason to accost this man at his breakfast. And she was like, just do it. And she was right. She was right. That one meeting spawned everything for me. I happened on the nicest person, Rich Lamarchand being the nicest person in games to just randomly come up to probably ever. He was the um, co-lead game designer on the Uncharted series at the time, um, was with Naughty Dog for a long time. Now he's a professor at USC. I've told the story a million times. He knows it. <laughs> so it's fine. But he was so encouraging. He was like, oh, we do cool things with actors. And I was like, cool. I, you know, that seems nice. And then I like watched all of Uncharted um, at home and was like, oh my God, I have to do this. I have to work with these people. I have to build everything towards working this way. But I followed who he followed on Twitter. And so he was following this wonderful mix of other AAA people, indie people. It was that way that I discovered Baby Castles, which was a DIY kind of like very artsy, very like scruffy, cool uh, collective that would do gallery sort of style games, showings and, and, and parties and events. And they were in New York. Um, and that's where I met Dave Gilbert. That's how I started working in, on adventure games with Dave. Uh, I met Lee Alexander there, I think, at a, at a Baby Castles party. She's been a friend for a long time. So I just started showing up to games events, really. Um, I got fired for attending my first GDC from my day job. That was great. Um, oh, my. Yeah, I came back and they were like, bye. I was like, oh, OK, fine. <laughs> so, yeah, like I, I started going to games events and then staying in touch with people on Twitter. And I think that was like my my secret kind of networking feedback loop is you like meet someone in a in meet space and you have a, a true connection and then you stay in touch on Twitter or you admire someone's sense of humor or something on Twitter and then you solidify that connection in person. So I really worked hard to kind of put myself in the mix and learn as much as I could about game development as possible because I'd played it for a long time. I had an actor background, but I wanted to understand the medium as a whole um, and the process as a whole. I was like, there's no way, I don't know how exactly, but there's no way that learning about this won't affect and improve my performance and my process as an actor. So so I spent a long time attending GDC and just like learning as much as I could for free. Back then, Twitter was an amazing place to learn a lot about game development for free. Yeah. So that was how. And then I think meeting other voice actors was just through other voice actors once I moved here, really. Like I, that was just people being like, you're great and she's great and you should meet each other. Like again, just people being super nice. So that was, yeah, I think I met Jennifer Hale actually at a, in a contest, which is a long story, but she was great and she invited me to stay in touch. And so I did. So yeah, it was huh. a long, it was a long process. Very purposeful process though. Yeah. And one person you've met and collaborated with bunches over the years is Ashley Birch. That's true. <laughs> That's true. You two go together like peas in a pod. Do you hey. purposely seek out these opportunities? That's a good question. I mean, do I purposely seek out opportunities to work with Ash? I would if I knew how to do that. <laughs> I would if I could like <laughs> knock on game developers' doors. Every now and then, I'll, I probably have already tweeted like, make me a game so Ashley and I can be best buddies <laughs> who run a heist. You know, like I've probably put those out there, but I don't actually have that kind of sway to make developers make a game for me, for us. But we have, you know, put each other in things. You know, I, I helped get her cast in. Um, I suggested her for Red Lantern. She has asked me to be in Hey Ash a couple times, which has always been super, super fun. So we are, we're so excited when we get to work together. I'm pretty sure there's a game right now where we are technically in conversation with each other, but we obviously aren't in the same room. Like we didn't get to work together. So that's fun, which is always how it works. But I, I usually I discover once the game is out. So yeah, like... I wish. I mean, if anyone listening who wants to make a game with me and Ashley, I'm like, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> My first time seeing you two together was at the Boston Fig, the oh Festival of Indie Games back in 2014 oh when you two God. were the keynote speaker. Oh, that's so long ago. That's so wild. I can't believe you were in that audience. Oh well, God. Boston was my hometown. I would go to yeah. Boston Fig every year. I, it was like seeing all the people who had ever been on my podcast. It was great. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we did. I think I'm trying to remember correctly. Uh, I don't know if Dan, you know, if, if someone running the, the show asked me first and I was like, well, I want to do this with somebody or, or if vice versa. I always tend to like I've done I've maybe given one or two talks now on my own. A handful, I've given a handful of lectures now on my own, I suppose. But um, I always prefer, and it's the same with Indicade. You know, they asked me to host the Indicade Awards, and I was like, I want a buddy. <laughs> so I got, I snagged Asher Vollmer, who made threes. 
Um, and I love that. I love sharing a stage with somebody and kind of taking care of each other on stage and being focused on supporting the other person as a distraction from like feeling totally on the spot. Yeah. So Ash and I both kind of put our hopes and dreams about what protagonists would be like into that little keynote. <laughs> oh, it was, it was a great keynote and very memorable. And clearly oh, you had a good okay. time too. We did. We did have a good time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you for coming. Of course. You mentioned that you're working next on The Red Lantern, which I saw on the show floor at PAX East 2020. Yay. Can you tell me a little bit about that game? Yeah. That game is, um, you you play as a, a young woman, Ashley, who will be voicing your person, who goes through a bit of an identity crisis, has tried a number of things, hasn't really excelled the way she expected to or that people expected her to. So she kind of throws caution to the wind and decides to go out to Alaska and race sled dogs. And you sort of join her at the moment in her journey when she arrives in Alaska and just sort of is kind of winging it and is like putting together a team of dogs and trying to get to her first destination, trying to get to her first home base, a little cabin out there in the wilderness, um, and then begin racing dogs. It turns out it's a little bit tougher to survive in the Alaskan wilderness than she expects. So a lot of procedurally generated events can occur to you on your ride out there to your cabin. Who you choose as your dog is, you know, and who to comprise your team is significant and your relationships with the dogs are significant. Uh, the wilderness is beautiful and dangerous and it's, I'm really excited about it as a game. Um, and I think Ashley does an amazing job. So many lines for one actress and, uh, and, and she just has so many, I love, I was excited to work with her for a number of reasons, but also her range. I knew that she would be funny. I mean, if you're out there talking to yourself in the wilderness, it can't just all be like terror and fear and boredom. Like you're talking to yourself, you're being, you're amusing yourself as best you can. So I knew she would be funny. She would be serious. You know, the, the moments of, action and capability that, that the, char- the character discovers in themselves would be real and true and strong and the moments of fear and and loss would be real and true and then the humor would be there. So I was I was really confident uh, when we cast Ashley that we would get everything we needed for a pretty um a pretty challenging part, I think. And your role in this production is voice casting and voice direction? Yeah, I sort of signed on as a consultant, which is sort of like a, an interesting menu of things because I started from the very broad thinking that indies just don't know where to begin with voiceover even. So um, my goal is to get them from knowing nothing to uh, being ready to record. So in that case, I was like providing information about the union process and and all of that other stuff, contract stuff, just structure, you know, helping uh, helping them to get the information they needed to budget properly. And then, yeah, um, I was like, I can also cast and direct this for you if you like. I feel like I would serve Sometimes I refer other directors to the project if I feel like that's the best move. I'm sort of, and then I'm kind of a casting director for casting directors, right? But um, sometimes I cast myself for that role because I, I think I can give something to that specific project. So yes, I so I, I suggested a few actresses and they really loved Ashley. And so, um, and then I voice directed her in the booth and it was so fun. <laughs> Walking the Paxi show floor, what drew me to Red Lantern was mm. the dogs. Yes. The Gotta dogs. love dogs. Please. Oh, they're so good. What was it that drew you to Red Lantern? I think it was it was the vibe. It was the atmosphere. I could picture something that would be soothing and challenging and kind of surprising. I love that the atmosphere of it, I think, was really special. And it's the kind of thing that like you get moments of in AAA games. You know, if you're on your horse out in Red Dead Redemption or something, or if you're in Horizon, there's moments of awe like that at, at beauty. But this seems kind of like a distilled, like just that stuff. None of the other stuff, just this stuff, you know, um, and that it might be a soothing cool game i i was drawn to the fact that the character would have so much to go through and that it would be a really really intimate relationship with the player um between their player character voice and and themselves i you know i think that you know working with a really talented actor was really exciting to me i also was drawn to the character themselves i think that um it was kind of nice not to not to like sort of be all rah-rah about it, but like it was me and Lindsay, who's the creative director of the studio and a very talented producer, very talented developer who wears a lot of hats and is also the writer on the project. It was me and Lindsay and Ashley. Lindsay Rostel is her name. Um, Timberline Studio is the is the company. And so it was just a team of us ladies in the booth kind of, you know, there was never any whisper of a mandate or threat or worry of a mandate that the character would have to sound sexier or that she would have to perform a certain kind of expected female toughness or that she couldn't have all of these notes in her in whatever f- way felt most authentic to us as women you know ashley could we could kind of push her in whatever direction felt true to us and not worry about some sort of focus tested perception of what a female character can be so that was kind of exciting in a low key way and that vibe yeah. in that room that creation process was really smooth and comfortable and fun for that reason too you know 
I really like the character and how she defines what it is she's going after and why. I mean, mm-hmm. she says that she grew up trying to live other people's expectations and she ended up being a disappointment. So now it's time to shed other people's expectations and try to fulfill her own destiny, whatever that may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's something that people relate to. We're all looking for a sense of purpose and how to live authentically. I mean, I think that's one of the one of the truer, more lasting messages or, or questions to kind of try and tackle with art, maybe not answer, but tackle, you know, is how can we be the best person that we can be and the truest person we can be? I was just on a different call for a different game yesterday, and we were talking about death, actually. There's a, there's a theme of death in, in the game and and the idea that the there is no way to prepare for death except to live authentically. That's the only thing you can do and that will leave you on your deathbed kind of not regretting things is if you had tried your best the whole time to live as authentically as possible. That's one way to think about it. It's probably not the only way to think about it, but that's certainly how I think about it. That's that's what I think about. That's the only thing I regret is if I felt like I didn't do something that I was drawn to do out of fear or something like that, you know. That's why I decided to do voiceover. Like I was like this is a silly career, but I will regret not having tried my hardest to do this if I don't do that. So I better do it, you know. Um yeah, anyway. <laughs> side sidetrack. <laughs> no, a very meaningful one. It's much better to regret trying something to, than to regret not trying it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I like I appreciate that character for doing that. She's out there trying to answer a question. Um, you know, and I think that's it's one that we can all relate to. Ladies and and other than ladies. <laughs> yeah. So we've been talking a lot about your voice acting, but you have this all this whole other realm of mm-hmm. yourself that we haven't broached yet, which is mm-hmm. game dev world. Ah, yes, I I put the dot in there. You know, my co-founders and other people like don't put the dot in there. They just say game dev game dev world. I've always said game dev dot world. I don't know why. Uh, I suppose it doesn't matter. Game dev dot world is also the URL at which you can find out more about it. Is handy, but I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me more about GameDev.World, which debuted last year. What is, for those who are not familiar with it and have not yet been to GameDev.World, <laughs> right, right. what is it? It is a global online free games conference. So it offers in its normal conference style iteration, not like the fundraiser, which we just completed. It is, although similar, it is a series of talks live streamed and translated live into from out of eight languages. So these talks are given in a variety of languages by people who make games from around the world, translated into all those other eight languages as a way to kind of spread and share game creation, game development, insight, inspiration, knowledge directly with folks in their native language, fluent and kind of confident in their native language to folks around the world. Um, It was, I can go into sort of how it came about. I mean, but that's, that's what it is. It's you go there for games talks to learn about how different games are made in different places around the world um, and to kind of see encounter the global game development community um, in this kind of intimate, kind of technologically facilitated way. Yeah. For free. Did I mention it's free? It's free. (laughs) (laughs) So it's free. So what need were you looking to fill with this that other events like GDC or AlterConf weren't themselves filling? Mm. Um, I... My personal inspiration, my side of the the GameDev.World creation story, origin story, biblical story, is... um, is that I was working as the game maker relations for IndieCade. Um, and I love IndieCade. I've loved IndieCade for a long time. I went from doing game maker relations to hosting their award show, which I love to do. And I, and I, and like I said before, like I already explained what I was kind of getting out of going to games events in person, but GDC is expensive. GDC is extremely expensive to attend on your own. Um, you know, companies that can afford to send their employees do, and then the folks who very well can't afford to send themselves have to, have to pay for themselves to go. Um, I paid for my own ticket for years as an investment in myself, and if I hadn't had those means, I would have been sad, you know. So I had that in my experience already of having attended GDC for a long time. I was working as Game Maker Relations for Indicate, and I had one developer whose native language was not English, was Japanese. His English was not very good. And I worked very, very hard to communicate. I was like the single bottleneck, the access point to the festival for all of the developers showing in the festival. And so I would send them important things like, we need these assets from you to help showcase your games on the website, to help show them to press. Like, here's, you know, there's information we need from you and information we have for you. And I was trying so hard to, like, make it very comprehensive, to not lose a single detail and to get it all out there to them. And I realized my emails were very, very overwhelming to this to one developer. And I happen to speak not, you know, increasingly poorly Japanese. So I was able to help bridge that language barrier, you know, in my own goofy kind of 
ad hoc way um, to help them participate in the festival and have a positive, productive experience. And but it just showed to me like how big of a language barrier there is in the world of development. And and this was this coincided with a blog post that Rami Ismail had posted about the language barrier in game development, that textbooks were in English, that coding had English kind of syntax baked into it, that the, that there was all this knowledge available at conferences and things that was just locked in English. Um, and I had just had this very personal experience with that barrier. Um, so I asked Rami, I was like, "What? can we do something about this? Uh, he was like, hmm. And I was like, I don't know what that should be, but it, I bet you do. And he was like, I think I do. And so that was how GameDev.World came about. So I'm like, not a super savvy streamer. I don't stream from home. Like I don't I don't know the tech stuff. Rami does. But that mission of wanting the game, you know, the game space, at least in this digital way, where it's like not bound by by, you know, the cost of attending something and um and, and the need to set up physical space and everything. I'm I'm very drawn by that uh that mission to create to create diversity in the space. I, I again, like I said, I'm greedy. I want variety. I want lots of different kinds of games. I want lots of different people making games. I want lots of different things to inspire your games. Like I, I'm so, I just want variety for everything. And that includes people making games, people who speak different languages, people who come from different backgrounds. I think that's true of Indiecade too. Indiecade has a mix of kinds of games. It has LARPing, it has tabletop, it has immersive theater. I'm thrilled by that. Um, just a formal variety of games. So that's kind of a through line for my for my, I guess all of my work is like more diversity and more collaboration, better collaboration, you know, building bridges and, and building communication between people. So that's the, that's the answer, I think. <laughs> and would you say gamedev.world was successful in meeting your ambitions? I think it was successful in meeting our ambitions. Of pro- I'm very, very proud of the programming that we got and the the speakers that we had. Um, and I think our, our graphics package is beautiful and classy. I'm grateful to our sponsors. I think oh, there were a lot of things about it. I mean, I think it had it had hitches and, and other technical stuff, you know, operational things that I, I have a long list of things that I'd like to improve for next year. I think every event does, right? But the fact that it exists and the fact that something is out there that people can say, can point to and say that should be better is already a step above people saying, well, I hope that exists someday. So yeah, so it's a success in that it was born and it shall continue to be a success so long as it grows, <laughs> you know. So that is to say there are plans for it to grow? I can't say anything specific about it right now. We just, we're kind of recovering from pulling off this fundraiser um, that we did a couple of weeks ago to benefit the GDC Relief Fund, actually, because GDC was canceled and the Wings Fund put together a relief fund for folks, marginalized developers in particular, who would have taken the brunt of that cancellation as a financial loss and a business loss um, the hardest. There's a fund for them. So we just did a kind of version of GameDev.World as a live streamed fundraiser to raise money for that. So we just finished that and then we will set our sights on round two. <laughs> so, so I did want to ask you about the GDC Relief Fund. GDC, the cancellation of it was announced while we were at PAX yes, East. It mm-hmm. And it was, you know, now that we are in the throes of a pandemic, we can see that it was the right call to make. Right. But knowing that it was the right decision doesn't help all the people who lost so much money on it. Sure. So your organization, your community, lots of overlap with GDC, but you were not responsible for the no. cancellation. You were not responsible for their expenses. Mm-hmm. In some ways, you could say you didn't have a horse in that race. So what motivated you to be the ones to step up and say, we're going to help you? Well, I think we always, we again, like I said, our, part of our mission was addressing the limitations in GDC. I found GDC, and I see them as perfectly complementary. I mean, I have had irreplaceable connections built at GDC that I'm not sure would have happened online. But I think there in in that, around in the negative space around that event where there was a lot of connections that could have been facilitated or that can be facilitated online and so our event exists in kind of in a kind of symbiosis with gdc and as a, a response to gdc and so we felt that it was consistent with our mission to try and help and offset those losses by by developers um so yeah it felt, felt very relevant to to us and to what we set out to do to do that so we, we were having meetings about it as that announcement was going down that weekend as I was doing like a bunch of different panels and like all kinds of talks and stuff. Um, we were we were already kind of putting the gears together to help support the Wings Fund to, to for relief. I would say you did a great job supporting it. You raised over $81,000. How did you go about doing that? Well, there were actually two pieces. I, I was more involved in the programming of the fundraiser, kind of reaching out to friends who I thought would have 
some leisure time in this crisis um, and also, you know, visibility to, to folks that folks would want to tune in to see. So I was kind of helping build out the programming schedule for the week. But Rami, on his end, also put together a game jam. People were making games to, you know, uh, all in for a weekend, I think. And then they put that in a bundle. There was a bundle that people put their jam games into that people donated their games to. Um, so when you donated to this fundraiser, you got over 160 games, I think, from the relief bundle. So I think it was really like a, a, a cool combination of all the the value offered by the event from the games themselves to to the, to the talks and to the sense of tuning into something cozy and sweet in this time that kind of that was so successful. Because I think we ended the fundraiser at like 60 something. And then, you know, over the course of the next two days, as people maybe heard more people heard about the fundraiser or watched the, the live streams or just knew about the bundle that they kicked it up. I think I offered a, a few Anthem codes as well. I have no idea if that moved the needle. <laughs> but but the Anthem team was the EA team was super, super nice to give me some codes to give away, um, as well as our donation total went up. So I was like, up late at night thinking of like, ways to scramble the code with like clues because I think people do that so bots don't scrape it so I was like trying to think of clues to like so people could finish the code and get the stuff but um yeah it was a lot of different efforts of ways of trying to get people's attention and and give them some real value for their for their donation that's wonderful that you had all these different approaches and that people responded so positively yeah. because you know smooth. GDC as you mentioned it's essential it's expensive mm-hmm. and a lot of marginalized people were impacted by it and I hope that you were able to help as many of those people as possible me too. I mean, I, I, I'd love to check in with the Wings Fund. I haven't really, um, with the Wings Fund people and see kind of how it's going to be used and, and sort of what, what the benefits have been. I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll probably disclose that at some point. It felt really nice to be helpful in this way as this was going down. It was a stressful thing to pull off. And for some reason, I have a harder time keeping my cool head, you know, doing events in general than I, than I do for other things, including voiceover, which is extremely chill. But, uh, but that being said, I feel like yeah, I think I think they'll probably share that and, and it'll be it'll feel so nice. I'll get to continue that feeling of feeling helpful in this time, which was a nice feeling. I know that the pandemic is affecting not only in-person events like GDC, but also some online events because people now are dealing with quarantine and not having access to the resources. Yeah. I know that you can't speak to gamedev.world at this time, but I'm hopeful that being an online event, it will be able to persist and maybe fill in some of the gaps from events like GDC. I mean, it has the potential to, I mean, we, we, people were speaking from home before, um, you know, and it it involves a lot of backend stuff, testing, you know, providing equipment where needed, you know, Intel very, very graciously, you know, rented us essentially, or or loaned us computers for folks who needed them. A lot came together behind the scenes to kind of equip people to give these talks from home, but it is something that we have already done. So that's nice. There's a precedent, you know, for doing things that way. Is it by running events like GameDev.World and doing fundraisers like the GDC Relief Fund, you had mentioned that you are a labor advocate. Is that how that title manifests itself? It actually more manifests itself in terms of um, I'm, I've worked a lot with the union, the, the actors union, SAG-AFTRA, as an ambassador to developers and to kind of represent their perspective as we continue to craft contracts and 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 keep a union. You know, a union has to be in touch with its own community and with the with the producers to stay relevant and to stay customer service, to stay useful and responsive, and all these things. Um, there's so much work to be done to create conversation and and mutual respect and accommodation in these two communities. So I think it's been more that I've been trying to you know um, help support and craft contracts like the low budget agreement for so that I could continue like to my point before to keep working on indies and to be part of the union we didn't have an indie game agreement low budget agreement before a couple years ago and so when I found out that it was in the process of getting put together I like involved myself very forcibly to make sure that it was run across you know the desk of a few indies that I trusted and had worked with and and make sure that it was tuned correctly to to capture the swath of work that we were aiming for and to create a real opportunity for for low budget games to work with really t- quality actors. So I think and and to do that there has to be all this healing between these two communities. You know, there was this contentious strike and and sort of the communication channel was a little bit scrambled. And it starts with being you have to in order to to have someone listen to your needs and to respect your what you say you require to do your job and to live sustainably and and healthily and all that other stuff that we want you have to extend yourself in the other direction i can say listen to my needs all day but if i haven't spent that time and i have spent that time i think the benefit of me having all these developer relationships is that i have spent that time investing in and listening to and being genuinely curious about my developer friends and how the other half lives i think there's a lot of 
doing that labor advocacy to me is about healing that conversation so that we come into a better understanding of what we need to do our jobs and to make beautiful games in the long term. So yeah, it's kind of like a culture shift thing that I'm doing. And then I also explain and and advocate for the contracts themselves. I, I am here. I'm not involved in game developer unionization because I, I'm not a game developer, but I am I am very happy as game developers kind of explore their opportunities and their pathways to actualizing themselves as a worker community and getting what they need to live well and to make games safely in the long term. I'm here as a resource. I can connect them with folks in the union who have experience with this stuff, just just as an example and as support. So that's, I think, where more of the labor advocacy comes in. Even though I'm not like a legal expert, a contracts expert, none of those things, it has to do with a paradigm shift in how we think about organized labor and that it's a good thing that it lifts everybody up. You know, that's a big shift to make. So but I think it's happening. And if it is happening, it's thanks to the tireless advocacy of people like yourself. So thank you so much for contributing your time, your energy, your passion. It would be very easy for you to be a part of the community and not be so engaged. Not everybody has that energy or that drive. And it's, it's great that there are people like you who do. Yeah, it's a re- it is interesting. It's, it's, it has to come from people who, are, who have that bandwidth. And, you know, and sometimes it means you trade roles. Sometimes you burn out and you take a little break and then you resume again. Organizing is, um, and I'm not even a technical organizer. That's not my title. But this work is, is sort of, yeah, it, can, it takes energy. And you're, and you're meeting people wherever they're at in this process of understanding this concept or, or resisting it or wherever they're at, you know. A lot of listening, you know, organizers themselves are feel, tend to feel, not me, but, but folks at the union tend to feel a lot of frustrations and, and kind of absorb, sponge up a lot of pain um, from their membership and from folks who work with them um, before they can then put everyone at ease and kind of clear the air and have a productive conversation. It's like a surprising bit of work. But yeah, so I mean, I, I, and I am surrounded by people who do it more nonstop and better and full time than I do. Um, and I'm always super, super inspired by them. But yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So we've been talking about your advocacy, your event organization, gamedev.world, voice acting, voice casting, Mm -hmm. LucasArts, Star Wars. (laughs) Is there anything else you want to cover today that we haven't gotten to? Oh my gosh. I don't know. That's quite a swath. (laughs) I took a few detours there, huh? (laughs) Um, I I am happy for every path we walked down. I think, I, oh, me too. I think it's all stuff I care about. I think I'm good. I have no burning need to cover something. I don't okay. Think. Well, remind our listeners where we can find you online. Sure. Uh, I am on Twitter and Instagram at Selmale, which is S-E-L-M-A-L-E-H. Wonderful. There will be a link to that in the show notes at polygamer.net. And if you want to read more about Sarah, she'll be doing a Behind the Game Spotlight on Tumblr, and there will be a link to that as well. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful chatting with you. It's been lovely to chat with you, too. Thanks for having me. Oh, my voice. Did you hear that little crack? I got to go drink some water. <laughs> <Good timing. laughs> this has been Polygamer, a GameBits production. Find more episodes, read our blog, or send feedback at polygamer.net. I don't know why I feel the need to refrigerate my Sour Patch Kids because they're like made of plastic. Like they're not going to go bad. I don't know. But no, they're very cold and very hard. (laughs) So is this a voice acting technique to chomp on candy while performing? Um, Not while performing, but um, (laughs) uh, sour things will get, (laughs) excuse me, will get your saliva going. So if you have that sort of smacky, thick sounding, um, situation going on in your mouth if you like eat a traditionally you'd eat like a take a bite of a green apple or something um but anything really sour will kind of make your saliva production go up and start to s- clean everything out so mm-hmm. huh mm-hmm. did not know that another trick of the trade there you go mm-hmm. that one's for free <laughs>